Section five of T. DeWitt Talmage as I knew him. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by K. Hand. T. DeWitt Talmage as I knew him by Thomas DeWitt Talmage. Milestone four, part one. 1862 to 1877. I spent seven of the most delightful years of my life in Philadelphia. What wonderful gospel men were round me in the city of brotherly love at this time! Such men as Rev. Alfred Barnes, Rev. Dr. Boardman, Rev. Dr. Berg, Rev. Charles Wadsworth, and many others equally distinguished. I should probably never have left Philadelphia except that I was afraid I would get too lazy being naturally indolent i wanted to get somewhere where i would be compelled to work i have sometimes felt that i was naturally the laziest man ever born i am afraid of indolence as afraid of indolence as any reformed inebriate is afraid of the wine cup he knows if he shall take one glass he will be flung back into inebriety i am afraid if i should take one long pull of nothing to do i should stop forever my church in Philadelphia was a large one, and it was crowded with lovely people. All that a congregation could do for a pastor's happiness they were doing, and always had done. We ministers living in Philadelphia at this time may have felt the need for combating indolence, for we had a ministerial ball club, and twice a week the clergymen of all denominations went out to the suburbs of the city and played baseball. We went back to our pulpits, spirits lightened, theology improved, and able to do better service for the cause of God than we could have done without that healthful shaking up. The reason so many ministers think everything is going to ruin is because their circulation is lethargic, or their lungs are in need of inflection by outdoor exercise. I have often wished since that this splendid idea among the ministers in Philadelphia could have been emulated elsewhere. Every big city should have its ministerial ball club. We want this glorious game rescued from the roughs and put into the hands of those who will employ it in recuperation. My life in Philadelphia was so busy that I must have had very little time for keeping any record or notebooks. Most of my warmest and lifelong friendships were made in Philadelphia, however, and in the retrospect of the years since I left there, I have sometimes wondered how I ever found courage to say goodbye. I was amazed and gratified one day at receiving a call from four of the most prominent churches at that time in America. Calvary Church of Chicago, the Union Church of Boston, the First Presbyterian Church of San Francisco, and the Central Church of Brooklyn. These invitations all came simultaneously in February 1869. The committees from these various churches called upon me at my house in Philadelphia. It was a period of anxious uncertainty with me. One morning, I remember, a committee from Chicago was in one room, a committee from Brooklyn in another room of my house, and a committee from my Philadelphia church in another room. My wife passed from room to room entertaining them to keep the three committees from meeting. It would have been unpleasant for them to meet. At this point my Syracuse remembrance of perplexity returned, and I resolved to stay in Philadelphia unless God made it very plain that I was to go and where I was to go. An engagement to speak that night in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, took me to the depot. I got on the train, my mind full of the arguments of the three committees and all bewilderment. I stretched myself out upon the seats for a sound sleep, saying, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? Make it plain to me when I wake up. When I awoke, I was entering Harrisburg, and as plainly as though the voice had been audible, God said to me, Go to Brooklyn. I went, and have never doubted that I did right to go. It is always best to stay where you are until God gives you marching orders, and then move on. I succeeded the Rev. J. E. Rockwell in the Brooklyn Church, who resigned only a month or so before I accepted the call. Mr. Charles Cravat Converse, LLD, an elder of the church, presented the call to me, being appointed to do so by the Board of Trustees and the session. After I had been unanimously elected by the congregation at a special meeting for that purpose held on February 16, 1869, the salary fixed was $7,000 payable monthly. In looking over an old notebook I carried in that year, I find, under date of March 22, 1869, the word installed written in my own handwriting. It was written in pencil after the service of installation held in the church that Monday evening.
the event is recorded in the minutes of the regular meetings of the church as follows monday evening march twenty second the rev t dewitt talmage having been received as a member of the presbytery of nassau was this evening installed pastor of this church the rev c s pomeroy preached the sermon and proposed the constitutional questions rev mr oakley delivered the charge to the pastor and rev henry van dyke d d delivered the charge to the people and the services were closed with the benediction by the pastor and a cordial shaking of hands by the people with their new pastor the old church stood on Shemerhorn street between nevins and power streets it was a much smaller church community than the one i had left in philadelphia but there was a glorious opportunity for work in it i remember hearing a minister of a small congregation complain to a minister of a large congregation about the sparseness of attendance at his church oh said the one of the large audience my son you will find in the day of judgment that you had quite enough people for whom to be held accountable my church in brooklyn prospered in about three months from the date of my installation it was too small to hold the people who came there for worship this came about not through any special demonstration of my own superior gifts but by the help of god and the persecution of others during my pastorate in brooklyn a certain group of preachers began to slander me and to say all manner of lies about me i suppose because they were jealous of my success these calumnies were published in every important newspaper in the country the result was that the new york correspondents of the leading papers in the chief cities of the united states came to my church on sundays expecting i would make counter-attacks which would be good news i never said a word in reply with the exception of a single paragraph the correspondents were after news and failing to get the sensational charges they took down the sermons and sent them to the newspaper many times have i been maligned and my work misrepresented but all such falsehood and persecution have turned out for my advantage and enlarged my work whoever did escape it i was one summer in the pulpit of john wesley in london a pulpit where he stood one day and said i have been charged with all the crimes in the calendar except one that of drunkenness and his wife arose in the audience and said you know you were drunk last night i saw in a foreign journal a report of one of george whitfield's sermons a sermon preached a hundred and twenty or thirty years ago it seemed that the reporter stood to take the sermon and his chief idea was to caricature it and these are some of the repertorial interlinings of the sermon of george whitfield after calling him by a nickname indicative of a physical defect in the eye it goes on to say here the preacher clasps his chin on the pulpit cushion here he elevates his voice here he lowers his voice holds his arms extended bawls aloud stands trembling makes a frightful face turns up the whites of his eyes clasps his hands behind him clasps his arms around him and hugs himself roars aloud hallows jumps cries changes from crying hallows and jumps again one would have thought that if any man ought to have been free from persecution it was george whitfield bringing great masses of the people into the kingdom of god wearing himself out for christ's sake and yet the learned dr johnson called him a montebank robert hall preached about the glories of heaven as no uninspired man ever preached about them and it was said when he preached about heaven his face shone like an angel's and yet good christian john foster writes of robert hall saying robert hall is a mere actor and when he talks about heaven the smile on his face is the reflection of his own vanity john wesley stirred all england with reform and yet he was caricatured by all the small wits of his day he was pictorialized history says on the board fences of london and everywhere he was the target for the punsters yet john wesley stands today before all christendom his name mighty i have preached a gospel that is not only appropriate to the home circle but is appropriate to wall street to broadway to fulton street to montague street to atlantic street to every street not only a religion that is good for half past ten o'clock sunday morning but good for half past ten o'clock any morning this was one of the considerations in my work as a preacher of the gospel that extended its usefulness a practical religion is what we all need in my previous work at belleville new jersey and in syracuse i had absorbed other considerations of necessity in the business of uniting the human character with the church character although the central presbyterian church in brooklyn of which i was the pastor was one of the largest buildings in that city then it did not represent my ideal of a church 
i learned in my village pastorates that the church ought to be a great home circle of fathers mothers brothers and sisters that would be a very strange home circle where the brothers and sisters did not know each other and where the parents were characterized by frigidity and heartlessness the church must be a great family group the pulpit the fireplace and the people all gathered round it i think we sometimes can tell the people to stay out by our church architecture people come in and find things angular and cold and stiff and they go away never again to come when the church ought to be a great home circle i knew a minister of religion who had his fourth settlement his first two churches became extinct as a result of his ministry the third church was hopelessly crippled and the fourth was saved simply by the fact that he departed this life on the other hand i have seen pastorates which continued year after year all the time strengthening and i have heard of instances where the pastoral relation continued twenty years thirty years forty years and all the time the confidence and the love were on the increase so it was with the pastorate of old dr spencer so it was with the pastorate of old dr gardiner spring so it was with the pastorate of a great many of those old ministers of jesus christ of whom the world was not worthy i saw an opportunity to establish in brooklyn just such a church as i had in my mind's eye a tabernacle where all the people who wanted to hear the gospel preached could come in and be comfortable i projected designed and successfully established the brooklyn tabernacle within a little over a year after preaching my first sermon in brooklyn the church seated thirty five hundred people and yet we were compelled to use the old church to take care of all our active christian work besides the first brooklyn tabernacle was i believe the most buoyant expression of my work that i ever enjoyed it drew upon all my energies and resources and as the sacred walls grew up towards the skies i prayed god that i might have the strength and spiritual energy to grow with it prayer always meets the emergency no matter how difficult it may be that was the substantial backing of the first brooklyn tabernacle prayer prayer furnished the means as well as the faith that was behind them i was merely the promoter the agent of a company organized in heaven to perpetuate the gospel of christ it was considered a great thing to have done and many were the reasons whispered by the worldly and the envious and the orthodox for its success some said it was due to magnetism as a cord or rope can bind bodies together there may be an invisible cord binding souls a magnetic man throws it over others as a hunter throws a lasso some men are surcharged with this influence and have employed it for patriotism and christianity and elevated purposes it is always a surprise to a great majority of people how churches are built how money for which the world has so many other uses can be obtained to build churches there are names of men and women whom i have only to mention and they suggest at once not only great wealth but religion generosity philanthropy such as amos lawrence james lennox peter cooper william e dodge miss wolf mrs william astor a good moral character can be accompanied by affluent circumstances in the seventies and eighties in brooklyn and in new york there were merchants who had prospered but by christian methods merchants who took their religion into everyday life i became accustomed sabbath after sabbath to stand before an audience of bargain makers men of all occupations yet the vast majority of them i am very well aware were engaged from monday morning to saturday night in the store and many of the families of my congregations across the breakfast table and the tea table were discussed questions of loss and gain what is the value of this what is the value of that they would not think of giving something of greater value for that which is of lesser value they would not think of selling that which cost ten dollars for five dollars if they had a property that was worth fifteen thousand dollars they would not sell it for four thousand dollars all were intelligent in matters of bargain making but these were not the sort of men who made generous investments for god's house there was one that sort however among my earliest remembrances arthur tappan there were many differences of opinion about his politics but no one who ever knew arthur tappan and knew him well doubted his being an earnest christian arthur tappan was derided in his day because he established that system by which we come to find out the commercial standing of businessmen he started that entire system was derided for it then i knew him well in moral character a one monday mornings he invited to a room in the top of his storehouse in new york the clerks of his establishment 
he would ask them about their worldly interests and their spiritual interests then giving out a hymn and a leading in prayer he would give them a few words of good advice asking them what church they attended on the sabbath what the text was whether they had any especial troubles of their own arthur tappan i have never heard his eulogy pronounced i pronounce it now there were other merchants just as good william e dodge in the iron business moses h grinnell in the shipping business peter cooper in the glue business and scores of men just as good as they were end of section four